this. Um, let me just click on got it. All right, so I again I'd like to welcome everyone here. Thanks so much for uh, choosing uh, this time, you know, lunchtime on a Thursday to um, to spend with us here and learning more about um, carbon loads uh, as in respect to passive house building. Um, let's see. Um, our uh, title here for today's webinar is Passive House as an Ecosystem, an Outline of Carbon Loads in a Three-Part Ecosystem. It's presented by Philippe Campus. He's one of our board members here at Connecticut Passive House. Um, I'd like to note that this webinar is uh, sponsored by Stephen Winter Associates. And my name is Kat Young. I'm your moderator today. Before we get started, I kind of want to go through some housekeeping items. Um, as you may or may not know, this webinar is qualified for CEU credits for under PHI, FIAS, um, and AIA. Uh, you can self-report with LEAD um, uh, with their re own respective web websites. And you, all along throughout the presentation, feel free to um, write in your questions in the chat box and I'll keep track of them so that at the very end of the presentation, we can have a Q&A session. If you'd like to send in a question anonymously, you can just use the pull down menu in the chat box and click my name and send me the question anonymously. Um, and if at any time after the presentation you have additional questions, feel free to email us at info at ctpassivehouse.org. Um, and now I'll introduce uh, Philippe to you. If you haven't already um, seen Philippe around in our other webinars, he is our, uh, like I had said, a, a board member at um, CTPH. He is also the principal architect at PHC Architects, his Branford, Branford based firm that specializes in passive houses. Um, in the community, he's served in various um, committees and boards. He's co chair at the AIA Connecticut Committee of Environment. He chairs the Design Review Board in Guilford, and he spends a lot of his time. Um, doing webinars like this in Connecticut and in Belgium. Um, he's a graduate, graduate of Ecole Nationale Supérieure in, uh, in Belgium. I totally botched that pronunciation, by the way. I'm sorry. I tried my best. That's too bad. <laughs> and and um, he uh, also uh, got his master's in environmental design in Yale. He is certified in both passive house uh, organizations, Passive House Institute and FIAS, and he's also a member at, um, of NESI. Uh, and I would like to thank Philippe for putting together this presentation. It, um, I got a, a little a snippet of it the other day, and I'm so excited to, to see more. Um, take it away, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for attending. Today, unlike most of the presentations that I uh, do on passive houses, I get to talk about my three passions at the same time. Passive houses is definitely one, but I actually started um, at a young age of 12, um, learning gardening from my great grandfather who, who is still alive uh, um, when I was a young kid. Um, later on, I discovered the amazing uh, benefits of uh, off-grid solar and started to build my own system for a vacation cottage. And um, as Kat said, um, I ended up uh, after the um, big uh, recession of 2008 and the um, construction industry meltdown uh, to reinvent my practice as a passive house designer. And uh, it's been so exciting, I never looked back. So today I'm putting everything together 
and that's why I'm I labeled this uh, presentation an ecosystem because like uh, all ecosystems, passive house buildings don't exist in a vacuum. They are part of a whole, and that whole is three parts, is the site the passive house is located on, and also the renewable energy it depends on, but comes from outside the passive house. So all these three are symbiotic and, um, they all play a role, good or bad, on the carbon footprint. And that's why we're going to talk about it. So what I'd like to do first is um, start by having a little bit of a definition um, so we're clear on what we're talking about. The carbon footprint is the best estimate of the full impact of climate change on materials or actions caused by the release of CO2. Um, the opposite of that is known as the carbon toe print, which is a common abuse of the carbon footprint because it either misses or hides some or most of the CO2 emissions caused. The problem with carbon footprint as a term is that it has suffered the same degradation that the label green uh, suffered about 12 to 15 years ago when everything was green, including Delta Airlines, because suddenly they were recycling the soda cans. So, um, and the last uh, CO2 definition is um, direct and indirect CO2. It's because the carbon footprint is more than just um, the um, carbon footprint of the items and elements, it's also all the emissions from all the steps starting at the origin. Um, where does carbon footprint come from? Um, well, here's a little guess. Carbon footprint was actually created in early 1980s, and I'll let you guess by whom. Here are a few choices, the Global Footprint Network, a Swiss NGO, um, the New York Times, the national newspaper, then, or William McDonald, the architect and author of the famous book, Cradle to Cradle, which was a precursor to this whole um, carbon analysis. Burger King, the multinational fast food corporation, or the US Department of Energy, which is a very good um, portion of his website now on carbon footprint, or how about British Petroleum, the second largest independent oil company? Any guess? I'll save you the trouble and the embarrassment. It is F. It is created by British Petroleum. And the reason is simple, but was not realized at the time. It was the 80s was when the um, press, the concerned scientists and a lot of people started to look at the impact of oil companies on um, global warming. And we're starting to question the effect of um, uh, petroleum-based products. And so they took a, a page out of the uh, food industry, which when um, the obesity and uh, diabetes crisis started to uh, become um, very noticeable, shift the blame from the excess amount of sugar in our diet to the problem that we were unable to control our own weight and our own diet. And so we were responsible for our own situation and that uh, we should exercise more as a way to solve the problem. So likewise, um, the carbon footprint shifted the blame from the oil companies that uh, at the time were busy hiding their involvement in the CO2 um, the crisis to individuals and the fact that they were just consuming way too much carbon. And so they were responsible for all this. So there you have it. Um, that's the way the carbon footprint uh, was born. Um, an ecosystem on a totally different plane is the functional unit of ecology where organisms interact with each other and the environment they depend on survive survival. And so that's essentially that, is that once you start to remove organism from the ecosystem, the ecosystem starts to fail. It may limp on and survive, but it is not a healthy ecosystem anymore. And finally, let's talk about CO2. Uh, CO2 is essentially a colorless and odorless gas, and it was assigned a global warming potential of one. And that allowed also to establish the CO2 equivalent, CO2E, because many of the gases that cause global warming are not CO2. And so they, we needed a way to kind of level the calculation so we wouldn't end up with half a dozen or two dozen items uh, to be accounting for. So everything got 
its CO2 equivalent. And the way they accomplished this was by taking the global warming potential that was assigned to each of the uh, greenhouse gases, such as methane, for example, CH4 or nitrous dioxide, and they got a global warming potential by which they're multiplied to determine the equivalent tonnage of CO2. So methane, which is a global warming potential of 21, um, for each ton of methane, you get 21 ton of CO2 equivalent. Those two photos are showing some of the large uh, CO2 emitters um, by uh, from satellite imagery. They're not to scale and uh, they're not even from the same period, but at least they give you a good idea of um, what's happening. Um, so, um, what happens in the passive house? So what happens in the passive house? Well, it's very simple. Um, the cradle to grave, um, which is essentially the CO2 footprint analysis, um, is um, essentially taking a database of 44,000 environmental product declarations records um, in, additionally, some BIM models and estimate um, that all in the ECCC, which is what the EC3 database stands for, plus CO2 factors of electricity and uh, other fuels and end of life emissions, which come from an EPA database. And so the um, uh, embodied carbon is split into two um, uh, sections. One is the product which uh, goes from um, A1 through A5, from the fabrication to the construction. Then there's the use of the um, uh, elements or the building or any other activity. And finally, there's the end of life. And so these are the three, essentially the A, the Bs and the Cs are the embodied component. In addition, there's operational carbon. And the difference is that that is the user in um, the um, activities inside the passive house or any other building as a matter of fact. And so the, as you can see right away is quantifying materials and energy is a lot easier than estimating the impact of user behaviors and also factoring the impact of repairs. Um, also missing from this list, as far as I can tell, are at least renewable energy and uh, battery electric vehicle charging, which um, sounds a bit insignificant, but in California right now, uh, battery electric vehicles represent 10% of the automobile um, in circulations. So what um, this um, uh, tally of uh, carbon uh, becomes is essentially the carbon load and the carbon sequestration and different um, scenario, different type of construction yield different results. And more carbon sequestration does not necessarily mean a smaller carbon load. Um, although it, the colors are very useful because it gives you an idea that in uh, case number three, the, with that, the um, end of life uh, disposal of the, the structure, the carbon sequestration and load are virtually in balance. And so that raises another interesting issue is why cannot this be modified now that it's apparent that it's one of the major issue in this scenario so that it will not be the case. And it has to do with a lot of practice. Um, in this case, it has to do with how certain materials are disposed by incineration, for example, instead of a more gentle uh, natural way of recycling which is, is an issue that is actually the low hanging fruit that could be dealt with any time, but um, was not apparent. So um, I outlined here the number of uh, passive as uh, construction systems. I'm not gonna go over all of them and also construction methods, um, which um, have come to the fore as uh, significant uh, CO2 generators. Um, in the site-built passive house, the materials are more like a trickle um, on the site coming from a local distributor. 
yet um, products such as windows, especially specialty tapes, um, other products like ERVs and so on can come from halfway around the world. Uh, panelized passive houses are on the other scale, at the end of scale, fabricated in offsite in a controlled environment that can maximize a lot of the operations and also minimize CO2. But the issue here becomes how do you bring large elements of a building to the site? And there suddenly the transport uh, CO2 becomes a significant element because um, in the case of this um, panelized passive houses, we looked at uh, eight 75 feet uh, trailer trucks uh, coming from New Hampshire um, to Connecticut. So um, it was not nothing insignificant. Finally, um, Embodied carbon also occurs in significant levels in mechanical system from HVAC equipment and ducts to HRV and ERV systems, and also domestic hot water and piping, especially because a lot of modern piping systems depend heavily on uh, petroleum-based products such as specs, the cross-link polyethylene and uh, PVCs and other uh, items that are not that desirable. Um, you can see from this photo, this illustrates the point perfectly. Um, the photo in the center in the middle is very um, easy to understand. Uh, two by six, 12 feet long is so many uh, grams or pounds of carbon. That's, that's a no brainer. And the material section is the easy part. Um, once we go into uh, equipment and um, processes, suddenly the methods become um, much thornier uh, in quantification. Here is a simple machine digging a um, linear footing trench or a diesel uh, crane lifting renewable equipment into place. But look at this picture, six uh, pieces of machinery, two uh, ready mix concrete trucks, one uh, diesel uh, lifting equipment and uh, three uh, trucks. Uh, one panel truck and uh, one van rather and two pickup truck. And this is just one day of a four or five month project. So you can imagine the headache, just bringing this to an accounting into a, a passive house database. Um, the passive house ribbon, um, the passive house ribbon is um, the way passive house has very recently acquired the um, ability to um, uh, account for uh, carbon and it's a product that came from England. It was created by uh, Tim Martell um, as originally it was a spreadsheet for remodeling and he had the brilliant idea of quantifying the CO2 for every element and as a very smart um, approach was to create it as an add-on that was that's inserted in the passive house database. So when you add the passive house ribbon, when you add the passive house ribbon to the uh, passive house software, it adds a tab which takes all the data from your um, wall assemblies, roof assemblies, floor assemblies, etc., and relies on this famous EC3 uh, database and the um, um, EPA database to. Uh, quantify using area uh, assigned to each material in the passive house software for each of the option. And you can create a number of them. In this case, there are four options and um, per assembly. The problem is that the passive house assemblies as they described do not include all, all the materials because it's geared to a thermal performance. It's that's the analysis performs. So, um, you can manually add the other elements, which pops up window, letting you choose either a local database, a world uh, database, or let you enter your own data if you have reliable uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, environmental uh, product declaration, for example. So you can um, complete the database and it generates this um, summary of embodied uh, carbon. You can see this, in this case, this was a British passive house, which is a concrete block and uh, brick veneer, um, uh, and brick veneer, sorry, uh, stucco, what they call a render 
uh, plaster, uh, which was like um, a uh, cementitious stucco. And you can see that the storage is minimal and um, but the demolition because uh, cementitious products are easy to recycle is also minimum. So it, it is not a great solution, but it is not a terrible one. Um, in the next scenario, they replace the CMU by um, uh, prefabricated straw bale, straw bale panels from Eco Cocoon, a prefabricated um, uh, passive house panel manufacturer that's available in Europe and now also in the United States. And suddenly the uh, sequestration shot up. But the problem is that the demolition and um, disposal shot up also for a stupid reason, because in England, they burn the straw when they're done. And so when they take the house down, they, they set the components on fire, which is mind boggling. Straw is an excellent mulching product. And when I, during the presentation, I pointed that out, people didn't know what to answer. They said it's too slow, um, my God. So the third option was trying to go a little bit beyond and it had the opposite effect. It slightly uh, pushed up the CO2, um, embodied CO2 and also the disposal simply by replacing some of the concrete floor slabs and other concrete foundation material by including a recycle slag from um, steel mill uh, byproducts. And finally, in the last passive house option, they simply added a heat pump because the first three, as it turned out, are with a gas heating system. And when you look at the uh, chart, you see, you realize what it really means. In the first scheme, which is uh, this in green, you can see the embodied carbon is about 20 tons, but the operational carbon is about uh, uh, 80, 78 tons. And that is huge. The recycling at the end is insignificant. That's this tiny blue thing, but the operational carbon is huge. And that's all from um, the um, system because you can see that all three with the same heating system have exactly the same increments. Um, the straw bale bring the passive ass to a, a negative embodied carbon because of the large um, um, sequestration, but the uh, ramp up to the end of the uh, embodied, um, so to the end of the operational carbon is virtually the same as the first case. The difference is that suddenly because of this asinine disposal methods, this uh, uh, disposal, which um, should have been very small, suddenly is huge. And the same thing happens um, with the um, heat pump which um, for some strange reason becomes positive again, even though it is essentially the same scheme as this one, but with the heat pump. What they factor in is the uh, refrigerant in the heat pump system that does not appear. And the fact that um, the database of heat pumps show in England shows that there is a certain number of repairs. It's all these little upticks here that keep pushing that uh, curb up when in fact it shouldn't be um, a reheat pump. And I don't know what product they use obviously, but um, it could have been a lot smoother and actually a lot lower. And then they face the same disposal issue. Nevertheless, if you look at the operational, even with all these issues, the operational is very small. It's about half the operational uh, load from all the other ones. So I think, it shows the need for understanding exactly how you analyze things and also for um, getting the right choice of inputs so you, you don't get bogged down in, in standard procedures. Um, because you can see here in the operational um, carbon of all four schemes, the first three have the same um, uh, natural gas uh, consumption and the heat pump cuts it to about a third. Uh, not quite a third, maybe 40%. And, but um, at the lifetime, you can see suddenly it's the opposite because of all these um, uptick and maintenance issues. So um, how do you get from um, this uh, present situation 
to getting um, to a lower level of carbon uh, generation and higher carbon sequestration. In a passive house, one of the obvious choices is the insulation because there is so much of it. And it's um, one of the driving factors in passive house performance. So you can see on the right, an outline of um, different materials, um, carbon positive and carbon negative. And on the left, you can see some of um, additional information because this doesn't reflect the recycle content, which should actually lower um, the carbon footprint of some of the products such as um, um, mineral, uh, cellulose, which is 85% recycle content. And um, it, this is just looked at the raw CO2 versus um, um, uh, uh, other ingredients. And uh, even urethane foams are far from um, uh, straightforward. If you look at the worst uh, urethane foam on the planet, XPS, which all has to do with the um, propelling agent to expand it. Um, it has a global warming agent of 1430. You compare this to EPS, which is a global warming um, uh, potential of seven. It is uh, staggering. Um, but some um, medium density closed cell foams that use uh, water or soy as a blowing agent suddenly drop down to a global, global warming agent uh, potential of one, which is enormous. Nevertheless, it is still an oil-based product. So you have to still to account with the negative aspect of the embodied carbon from the fabrication of the product. So beyond the low hanging fruit of insulation, um, where do you go next? What else can you do? Um, passive house uh, in its name embodies the term passive. And that is because part of the concept of the passive house is the passive energy side. And so how can you maximize the passive house energies on the passive side? So those um, disciplines or methods have been used from time immemorials. They're the oldest methods of heating, as a matter of fact. Here is a, an Asazi um, construction in Canyon de Chez in um, Arizona, um, where a south facing uh, dwelling was built under a cliff um, to maximize and shelter the um, structure that was entirely heated by the sun and depended on the thermal mass of the material for maintaining this heat through the next 24-hour um, cycle until the sun would come out again. In some other countries, um, passive cooling is also accomplished simply by uh, using the, therm the thermal mass of materials. In uh, southern countries, uh, this is an 18th century 28-inch uh, thick um, limestone wall. And what happens uh, in the summer simply is that by the time the, sorry, by the time the um, uh, exterior ambient temperature exceeds the temperature inside the dwelling and the building gets closed off from the outside, windows and doors and uh, shading, the masonry delays the transfer of temperature from the outside to the inside by up to eight hours. So starting from 10 a.m., you end up at 6 a.m. Um, to see the temperature starting to raise, 6, 6 p.m., sorry, the temperature starts to raise inside the building. And so that allows by then, um, as the exterior temperature starts to drop again because it approaches uh, evening, to open up everything again and ventilate. So essentially, even though it's exposed to the heat, the um, uh, thermal mass, which is essentially um, the density of the material slows down the way electrons travel through the material, um, uh, creates enough of a lag time so that there is no insulation, uh, no ventilation needed when the temperature um, exceed, usually it's around 75, 76 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, around uh, 9 to 10 a.m. And that's the temperature you try to maintain inside. By 6 p.m., uh, from my own experience, it's around 77, 
or so degrees. And by then that's about the temperature that the outside air reaches also as evening breezes pick up um, because of movement of um, cold air from the top of the hills down to the bottom um, cre uh, moves some cold air masses along with it and facilitates uh, uh, cooling. Um, today there are other materials and I will go in some details in a product that I discovered recently and I've started to experience with called phase change materials. And um, I think it holds some promise, but um, requires some a better understanding of, of um, uh, how to design for it. Another product, uh, another approach that has been very popular in Europe and less so in America. And I think that's because um, as we become more proficient in high tech, some low tech um, approaches get fall out by the wayside and gets ignored. But um, it's the preheat and pre-cool approach of ventilation air. And um, two approaches exist. One is the direct um, underground ventilation where air is absorbed uh, is, is drawn into tubes that go down about two meters or six and a half feet below the ground for about 150 feet and ground temperature being around uh, 55 to 60 degrees um, year round, um, the 80 degree or so or a higher air is cooled uh, sufficiently uh, through low velocity uh, air movement and um, is brought into the house uh, through a heat exchanger where it pre-cools or preheats the air that's used in the ERV. These actually um, images of Catherine Klingenberg's own house, the first passive house ever built in America in 2004, just outside Urbana, um, where she used that system because in Europe at the time, it was a very common and very good strategy. Um, Another uh, approach that's more popular in America and I've used uh, on occasion is the ground loop heat exchanger where essentially you replace the uh, earth tube with a glycol loop that you connect to a similar um, energy exchanger um, only for preheating though um, in uh, feeding into the ERV or HRV. Um, and what that does is it preheats the uh, incoming air, which is a huge difference because you're looking at air coming in maybe at 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so being mixed with 55 or 50 degree air before it is even processed by the HRV and ERV. So you cut essentially the uh, BTU load in your ERV by almost half. Um, but um, Lately, it's not been used. The drawback of the ground loop heat exchanger is they're not cold enough to extract moisture. So they don't really work very well for pre-cooling because they raise the moisture unacceptably high. So what about these um, um, phase change materials? Um, this is what I've been using. Um, I um, Last year, I purchased the um, solar greenhouse um, because I have continue to be passionate about growing vegetables and I'm now doing it year round or I, I attempt to with some success. And um, reading through, I stumbled upon a reference um, in a very interesting book about uh, uh, passive greenhouses um, that refer this particular product. And this is a 12 by 12 uh, phase change material tile. It's a, a mineral-based inorganic um, um, compound that um, has uh, phase change properties that can be uh, programmed for either a 65 degree phase change, 72, 77, or 84. What that means is that at those set points, the material um, either uh, goes from a, um, I guess, slurry semi-liquid state to a solid state, when the temperature drops below or uh, from a solid state to a liquid state. In either case, it takes uh, sensible energy and turns into latent energy, which is either substantial absorption or substantial release. And that is um, a remarkable source of energy. Um, here is some illustration from the website uh, that shows some application, some other application. This was the one that um, turned me on. There are some other applications in commercial uh, um, situations where they improve the performance of um, large uh, cooling ducts or commercial greenhouses. This is what I did. 
Um, here's the greenhouse. It's a very small six by eight footprint greenhouse that I um, uh, built uh, last summer. And um, in the fall, when I um, got those um, tiles, those uh, um, PCM tiles, I attached them to the north wall, which is, excuse me, a very good strategy because north wall is the only wall in a greenhouse that produces nothing. And so it doesn't generate heat, it only loses heat. And so um, you want to place uh, plants on the north wall to get the maximum insulation to the greenhouse to maximize the use of space. And also at the same time, you don't want the cold to radiate from the north wall directly on the plants at night because the temperature swing is significant. And so that's the ideal place. I, here's the assembly, uh, inch and a half of polyiso uh, against the, the uh, greenhouse panels, gives me a R9 um, plus the, ten and the one and a half R value of the double wall greenhouse, a quarter inch uh, cementitious board uh, that's actually a siding panel and um, the PCM tiles in white in front. And this is what I recorded. Last week was a perfect week for this kind of testing. I had a, a heat sensor located in the greenhouse and on gre in red at the bottom, you can see the minimum nighttime temperatures. There's a um, chart uh, starting on uh, Sunday that shows those temperatures here. And um, these are the temperatures that I verified um, uh, outside. And you can see the first day uh, when it started uh, last Friday on the um, 25th, I guess. Um, it was cloudy, so the, and it was also late in the day when I put the sensor and the temperature was already dropping. Um, Saturday was very cloudy and didn't produce much energy. And that was the lowest um, uh, minimum uh, temperature in the greenhouse. Yet you can see that it still remained substantially warmer. It's almost, it's, it's about uh, 24 degrees different from the outside in this structure, which is pretty impressive. That means that uh, no plant would ever been harmed at this temperature. The next day was very sunny. Um, it reached the high of um, low 80s, and it also the weather was very cold, yet the energy stored was sufficient with uh, 4,000 BTU uh, uh, potential capacity from the PCM tiles that it actually didn't go down to the minimum. It stayed above 50. And the following day was even sunnier, but had some cloud pattern, which gave this kind of sawtooth peak. And, um, but enough energy was acquired because of the higher peak that it stayed even warmer, being um, above 50, definitely on the coldest night of the week. And um, as we started to get more cloudy on Tuesday, on uh, Tuesday and yesterday, um, the peak got smaller and smaller. But um, as it is often the case, the clouds also um, held more e uh, heat. Uh, over the planet and kept um, more heat from being lost by the ground uh, onto the black sky because the cloud added like an insulating blanket. So um, it actually stayed remarkably warm, even though there was not that much gain. So what that means to me also, and this is where my next phase of measuring is I need a more sophisticated material uh, testing device so I can see how much energy in my uh, storage system is actually transferred to the next day because it exceeds the loss on, uh, on through the greenhouse during a single evening. So very excited by these results. At the same time, I started an indoor experiment. In the mid eighties, I built this um, uh, solar uh, sun space by, because the US government, believe it or not, was giving you tax credits for creating sun spaces. Um, it was a very popular strategy at the time was passive was high. And um, it's an unheated space that uh, is attached. It's a two-story space that's attached in the, um, in the uh, corner between the kitchen space and a living room. 
and to which I eventually added a three season porch, which is, you can see the kitchen is behind there. You can see it's the lit area. This is the living room and here's the porch on the side there. And so the way the space normally functions is that during the day, it builds up a substantial amount of energy, which is okay because it's circulated through the house because of the operation of the uh, heating and ventilating system. And at night, the reverse flow happens, which is not great, but um, that's because I raised plants in the greenhouse. Obviously, it was too tempting, but I could also close the doors and let the greenhouse just um, uh, survive on its own and generate more heat the next day, which is what I did during this experiment. I uh, got some plywood uh, backing panels um, that I um, mounted on the wall. Each panel has 26 tiles. And um, at the last minute, seeing the results, I actually added another 16 tiles, 12 here and four down here. And um, also because this was all improvised, some of the lower panel uh, direct exposure to the sun, and I uh, create some made up uh, shading with some um, gardening cloth that I use for shading cucumbers in the summer from uh, sun damage also, um, just to keep the tiles from um, becoming softer because the PVC tiles are very sensitive to direct sunlight as I discovered. And so in this installation, I have a 6,800 BTU um, from 68 tiles. And I have one um, ceiling fan running in reverse to push the air down um, at the low speed and running 24 hours a day. And in this instance, also at night, throughout actually night and day, all the doors remain closed. And so there was still a bit of air leakage uh, in heat from the heated space and some leakage from this uh, not well-built uh, building, which is typical 1984 construction, two by fours with R15 fiberglass, um, R24 ceiling, and um, new air drafts uh, or um, um, new um, uh, uh, caulking to speak of. And the only other thing is that there is a thermal floor, which is uh, a three quarter inch uh, marble tile sitting on a one and a half inch cement bed, uh, which uh, it's a dark green tile. You can see it a little bit here which is remarkably effective. Um, it literally is becoming, becomes a radiator uh, during the day. And so this is what it, the readings were for the same period of time, same temperatures at night. Um, the sensor were placed roughly at the same time. And you, you could think I use the same chart for both, but you can see that the minimum and the max in the average are different, which will confirm that these are different readings. Um, it was a little bit cooler, as a matter of fact, because the larger volume, the um, uh, the ratio of, of BTU to the total volume is different, and also because of the different condition. Uh, um, nevertheless, um, it is impressive that um, with that supplemental heat on the worst day again, um, it went down to just below 50 which was about um, 24 degrees uh, more than this uh, uh, outdoor temperature, which would not have been the case, I can tell you from experience, because on very cold days in, uh, uh, in the middle of winter, we do close everything to isolate the space and not waste uh, energy in the rest of the house. And um, you can see the same uh, cloudy day yielded the same low gain yet it was some of the highest um, minimum at the same time, which shows that there is definitely, in my assumption, a transfer of energy from day to day, because while it is not enough BTU to um, smooth the peaks and the valleys, it is smoothing it to the extent that it, what it really does in uh, my take is that it's actually smoothing the valleys more than the peaks because that's when, that's because I chose the uh, set point uh, for phase change of the tiles uh, with my greenhouse in mind, not with the space. And, um, but as I was going through the process, I decided this was worth an experiment. So I think this is very promising. This, um, the issue now is designing and managing the amounts better, but um,
that was unexpected. So um, beyond this uh, CO2 reduction, um, the other major element for reducing carbon footprint in especially operational carbon is uh, the uh, renewable energy. So looking at um, the renewable energy, um, I itemized the different types. I'm not gonna go over all of them at this point. It's um, well known. Um, I'm going to talk about analysis and siting because these are the two real um, renewable energy issues. The problem with um, uh, analysis is people rely on rule of thumb. And um, this is what it gives. Um, rule of thumbs are terrible. You can't get any results from looking at last year's belt. Um, you need to at least look for the highest build in the say last five years because that's your peak load and that's just like the peak load on a HVAC system. That's what you're designing for because you're going to face that problem again. Once you have that peak load, you need to add 10% minimum because as climate change gets worse and pushes loads up, panels also loses efficiency. And you, in 20 years, your panel will produce 10 to 20% less. So you now have 10% more with a 10% lower output. It doesn't add up. Finally, you need to maximize your performance. Um, your panels are mount, ground mounted. You can do a, a seasonal tilt adjustment, which in my experience adds about 10% yearly output. And finally, you have to take into account that shading will become worse over time unless you have your um, tree pruning crew on hand um, every year, which is not usually uh, what happens. And my, my own experience or my own decision is when we did decide to go um, the uh, zero energy way, the first thing we did was put our solar panels because that is the only thing we could do that started to pay back the very next day. And after three days of installation, we could start to see a return. So the passive house analysis is probably one of the most extensive for renewable energy. It starts with the electric energy um, uh, tab on the passive house uh, spreadsheet, which itself is a summary, but a very detailed summary. Um, it then uh, goes into a description, sorry, it goes into a description and a calculation of the photovoltaic system by matching the panel um, to, the, to the roof orientation and the roof size to make sure it fits and it works using the panel characteristics to calculate the yearly output. And finally, summarizing it into this um, analysis of performances versus load. And so you have the three levels, the classic passive house class, which is zero um, or very little renewable, the passive house zero energy level where the um, uh, performance of renewable system offsets 100% of your loads. And this is this X here shows the certified passive house that this um, um, data sp uh, spreadsheet um, are looking at. And then the ultimate, um, passive house, which is premium, where you put energy back into the grid as a community a service where your passive house goes beyond your needs, it goes into the community needs. So then the issue is um, the siting of the renewable energy system. And that's also very important because you can undo all your efforts if you get it wrong. Um, the two things that are important is the panel tilt and the panel orientation. Let's talk about orientation first. This is the certified passive house we're talking about with the 26 panels. Um, this, is, this is the classic east-west orientation based on the magnetic north, which is here. And that's the first challenge. Um, solar north and magnetic, magnetic north don't match. Um, solar north is off depending on where you are in the country by from zero to 15 degrees. You can see here what is known as the magnetic declination chart. And what that means is that the magnetic declination um, ISO lines actually all uh, go back into the one point, which is the magnetic pole. And that is the reason why they're not parallel to each other. And so if you're on the East Coast, the Connecticut, the declination is 14 to 15 degrees westward, whereas on the west coast, the declination is uh, 12 to 14 inches eastward. 
And so in this case, we tilted the building 11 degrees west in the compromise between views and uh, maximum output. Once you have this orientation, the other issue is the actual tilt. And this uh, chart shows you that um, depending on um, the um, orientation and the tilt, you can go from the sweet spot, which is 100% performance. Um, in our uh, location, it is a 40 degree uh, tilt with um, the um, ideal um, orientation, which is um, 180 degrees, but that's 180 solar degrees, not 180 magnetic degrees. And if you really blow it, if you're 90 degrees um, from that uh, uh, latitude, uh, uh, latitude uh, sorry, azimuth, then you're down from 100% to 60%. So that is a huge um, uh, difference. So here are two examples. This is a certified passive house. This is what PHPP um, predicted as the performance of the solar system. They would make it net zero. Um, the scale is different from the scale of the actual uh, first year consumption, but you can see that uh, this dip during the month of June actually occurred in um, the passive house um, and um, was, um, uh, in fact, you can see the same. This is my own um, passive solar installation, which uh, made us uh, zero energy also. And originally it was just these 18 panels for a 6.2 kilowatt system. This is what you see here. And you can see the same dip um, at the same time of the year. Um, this is the performance which shows you why you look for the worst case scenario because in 2016, the first year, we produced virtually eight megawatts. Um, we produced uh, about 0.4 megawatts less the next year. And the three bold uh, years, in fact, are um, when we started to adjust this tilt seasonally. You can see the summer angle and you can see the winter angle. And there is a 30 degree difference in tilt between the two. This is 25 degrees and this is 65 degrees. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is the, yes, 35 degrees, 65 degrees. So that's what it is. 35 degrees, 65 degrees based on latitude. Yet, we, the first year we tilted the panel, we had the worst um, performance. And that was because we had a very rainy, cloudy summer. And so our uh, outcome was minimized by the weather. Um, our average performance has been 7.54, but we did notice that we had somewhere between seven and eight, seven and 10% um, annual gain from these four um, uh, seasonal adjustments. Uh, we since added these um, two megawatt of uh, solar power um, additionally, because uh, we found that our power consumption increased significantly once I started to charge a Tesla on the solar panels. So the last item in the renewable energy um, is our energy storage and backup. The two major options other than the grid are uh, the on-site option are generator and battery uh, storage. I'm gonna go very quickly through this. Uh, generators are very common. They're noisy, inefficient. Um, it's basically a lawnmower engine or about inside. It's very slow transfer. Everything shuts down and restarts. It needs its own fuel source. It uses 17 hours a year, even if you never use it, just to test itself. And it requires annual maintenance. And it's also very weather um, uh, dependent. We had a starter freeze because the oil congealed on an incredibly cold winter uh, morning the day it was doing its own self-test. Uh, the other end of the scale are batteries, which provide seamless transfer, unlike generator, which only work in, um, sh uh, when the power shuts down, the batteries work daily. And so what they do, and this is where, this is the most important part, because the power company has to generate two and a half to 2.7 kilowatt to sell you a kilowatt. Um, batteries save for every kilowatt of site generated power, 1.7 kilowatt. 
because if this kilowatt had come from the grid, even if you had stored your kilowatt on the grid, the kilowatt that comes back from the grid is not the same kilowatt now. It is um, the 1.7 extra kilowatt of generation and transmission, um, which is eliminated when uh, you use your power. And the reason it's important is because you use very low power during daytime. Um, it's something that Mark Rosenbaum had shown very well in his study of uh, zero energy houses. The typical user uh, generating solar power uses between 17 and 27% of what is generated during the day. So most of the power generation is when you don't produce it. And that's where the battery become fundamental. It's no operational CO2, it's located indoors, which is protected, and it's also modular. So that's it for the renewable. And the last aspect of the um, ecosystem, and this is where it really becomes different from looking at the traditional construction. This is probably the first time that um, you discussed or you attended a presentation where part of the building discussion included the trees, the grass, the birds, the insect, the bacteria, and the lawnmower. And this is why. Um, as I said at the beginning, you don't build a, vac a passive house in a vacuum. There is something outside the front door. And that something can uh, make or break a passive house and nobody's aware of it. This is what the tree is, 20% leaves, 60% trunk and 20% roots. And this um, natural element is a CO2 potential of absorbing 48 pounds of CO2 per year per tree. But that is after 30 years of growth. And what that means is that if you cut a tree, it takes 30 years for the sapling to recover the energy loss, the CO2 lost by the uh, tree cutting. And so these 30 years that the mature tree is gone at 48 pounds a year amounts to 1,440 pounds of lost CO2 while the tree reaches the equal um, of CO2 capacity of the other tree. And until then, any CO2 produced is going to erase uh, this CO2. Um, the other uh, CO2 source, which is totally um, uh, beyond the below the radar, are even organic lawn. Um, one hundredth of a pound <clears throat> of uh, CO2 per square foot per year, which means that a 10,000 square foot lawn still gives you 100 pounds of uh, CO2 sequestration a year, which is not negligible. It's basically uh, like two trees. And native wild grasses, which have a greater potential, <clears throat> and obviously 1,000 square feet is a quarter of an acre, so it's a different size area than a tree. Um, for the same uh, 10,000 square feet, which requested 250 pounds per year. And the last thing that um, blew my mind when I did read about it, um, and if you want to know more about it, I recommend heartily Elliot Coleman's uh, writings, um, uh, year round um, and vegetable growing and um, winter vegetable growing. It's an amazing uh, discussion. He was the head of the Organic Growers Association for a long time. And what it uh, boils down to is a teaspoon of healthy soil contains between 1 million, 100 million and 1 billion of bacteria. And guess what? That is essential to carbon sequestration because that is what recycles nutrients and decomposes organic matter. And the organic matter is those parts of the trees and the grass that fall on the ground, whether cut or dying, and are converted into um, fuel for the living part of the site. And so um, that, that is the cycle, that is the part of the ecosystem where elements um, that we don't look at uh, play a significant role in um, the climate change. Um, I'm gonna skip this uh, description, but you can read about what tree um, contribute in addition to the CO2. And so um, how does that translate to an actual site? Um, you need first to assess the site, look at the material trees and um, 
uh, the number of them, the type of ground cover and its condition, the type of such soils, where is clay, sand or rocks, because they all have an impact on building siding and building work, uh, the health of soils, and also drainage and erosion issues, because remedy is a CO2 footprint and prevailing wind speed and direction, because this gives you some other options for renewable energy, as well as the solar orientation. And finally, you need to look at related weather risks. Um, you saw uh, this photo of um, uh, on the uh, first slide on um, the same day on August 28, 2020, 85 miles an hour shear winds blew um, a 50 maple foot maple tree down on my property and missed the house by less than six inches after several days of rain. Um, and so this is what happens during uh, site preparation. Tree cutting, stump removal, brush clearing. That is the worst CO2 impact. And you can mitigate it slightly by shredding everything. So you turn the tree instead of uh, wood fuel into mulching, which would re regenerate uh, CO2 and also improve the soils. Every earthwork, including stockpiling, my rule is to reuse everything, minimize the um, footprint by do not, re not removing anything stockpile and reuse everything. Erosion control and protection of remaining assets, that is usually neglected and it plays a big role because as far as uh, builders are concerned, uh, natural assets are an obstacle. And if they don't remove them surreptitiously, it will just damage them. So you need to be proactive about this. And finally, in a way to mitigate the first steps, you have site restoration and biodynamic landscaping. Biodynamic landscaping is maximizing the CO2 reduction, um, either taking advantage of potential of the site, using native plants. And the reason for using native plants is just not because they look right, is because native plants will do the best in the site because they've been there totally adapted for years and decades and sometimes centuries or even longer. Uh, using rain gardens instead of um, uh, yard drains and um, leaching systems uh, to get rid of it and minimizing maintenance. Um, so this is how it translates. Um, I, this is some blur on synthetic fertilizers and synthetic pesticides. Uh, the impact uh, just from the CO2 is significant. A 25 pound bag of nitrogen, which uses the most energy because it's produced uh, from natural gas is 68 pounds of CO2. So if you apply, uh, you take 45 pounds per, per 10,000 square feet. And if you apply it four times a year, you can imagine, you're gonna look at this. And so the two uh, uh, type of sites are right here. You can see the standard, uh, as I described, mode, sterile and hostile site with no food for wildlife or insects, no refuge, no hiding from predators. And all these matter because all these um, participants in the ecosystem play a role in keeping the ecosystem healthy. No organic matter is a fertilizer. So now you start to realize um, you end up adding fertilizers and this is where this come from. So you've removed all the goodness of the system in a sense, and you're replacing with synthetic products that do not work the same way. Um, very simple. It's the same as vitamins. This, these are vitamins. Um, you can get vitamins from um, your food. You can get um, vitamin C from oranges. You can get um, uh, vitamins A from spinach, from green leafy vegetables. Uh, you can get a lot of antioxidants from each deep color vegetables, and I'm not going to teach you uh, diet rules. Um, or you can take all these vitamins individually. But when you take the vitamins individually, you're not um, nourishing a system. You're just doing a point intervention. And so you create an imbalance, as a matter of fact, that exactly what uh, fertilizers and pesticides do. You end up um, adding the nitrogen to get more uh, leaf production, and you end up with an imbalance with the other ingredients. So you disequilibrate the system, and you end up with plants that are stressed and struggling and are less resistant to pests and disease. So now you bring pesticides to deal with that. Um, the United States has used 1 billion pounds of pesticides in gardens, parks, homes, and farms. It is huge because pesticides also kill beneficial organisms as well. 
as the um, unwanted organism and also contaminate water, cause severe reaction in people and many unknown carcinogens. Natural um, sites on the contrary even act as carbon sin. So this is how it looks. Um, here is the CO2 from site work. Um, cut 10 mature trees, 14,400 pounds. And that does not include the bucket lift and the chainsaw. You're not replanting six of them. So you have another penalty of 29 pounds from the um, additional life those cut trees would have, um, uh, and the carbon they would have sequestered. Now you're clearing a minimum of 5,000 square feet of land between your driveway, your walkway, your beautiful lawn, your um, building area, equipment access, stockpiling, etc., And so that is another 125 pounds from the brush. And you do get a credit from mulching um, the cords of wood. A uh, cord of wood is 128 cubic feet. Each uh, 16 inch diameter tree is half a cord. Uh, that's how we get to that number because it's 44% uh, of the tree is, CO is carbon. Um, and now is the yard maintenance. If you look at um, maintenance equipment, it is every bit as bad as the construction equipment. Uh, riding more 19 pounds of CO2 per year, in addition to the fact they don't have an exhaust system, so they release also a lot of bad items as well. A typical American lawn is a quarter of an acre, and it takes 45 minutes um, on average uh, when you factor in the borders, the uh, topography, and so on. And so that amounts to 16 hours a year uh, during the season, to which you add seven hours of leaf blowing a year. So this is what it adds up to for a classic uh, lawn. Um, fertilizing programs, that is the worst part. Um, the pesticide, I estimate it mostly is things like tick control and um, mosquito control. Actually, we're not assuming uh, uh, a pesticide uh, cycles such as um, woolly, um, if, uh, aegis, and so on that uh, strike from time to time. Um, the riding mower, um, itself, um, the trim, uh, trimmer and leaf blower. And then finally, because the it's not all grass and driveways, you also have the composite decks, the PVC fans, the paved driveway and so on. You have some pressure washing. So you're looking at more than 500 pounds of CO2 a year. So you're looking at the 17,000 pounds of CO2 from side um, impact, which is huge. It could a double the impact of your passive house and another 500 pounds of CO2 per year. You're there for 20 years, you're looking at about 10,000 pounds of CO2 uh, uh, contribution. So to conclude, here is a very nice example um, that you may be familiar with. Um, uh, board members, um, Al Alicia uh, Freeman and her husband, Bill, built a zero energy house last year, which um, they um, invited people to visit, not for the house, for the garden. And that was, was so interesting. In a nutshell, this is what um, they showed. And Alicia made a very good pamphlet explaining all of this. And she also has posted several um, uh, signs right at the edge of the property to teach people about uh, how they went about and how they can uh, do the same things. But vegetable production uh, in yellow, a mini orchard, raised beds, and a um, uh, round um, vegetable growing patch. Um, hatch is the wild garden, so to speak. It looks like it's about close to half, including the vegetable production, which also is good at sequestering carbon um, around the property in um, untouched um, uh, trees, shrub, and um, uh, wildflowers that are both a habitat, a um, food for pollinators, and birds, um, which are natural insect control. We are we have in our own yard a pesticide-free yards, and um, uh, we we try to raise as many bugs and uh, 
um, bees and butterflies, as you can imagine, as odd as it sounds. And if you look at it, a lot of the remaining unbuilt yard is this no mowing lawn, which is very interesting. It's sheep fescue, a, a drought resistant, low growing grass that uh, does not exceed above six inches and does not require mowing. And um, by this assembly of different options, they've created a very pleasant, very attractive yard that is also um, carbon sequester, um, uh, nature friendly, and creates a, a homogeneous ecosystem that uh, is much more sustainable and um, maintenance free than our traditional um, beautiful um, landscape. So, this is where we are. I can um, talk a little bit more about a personal experience, or I can instead answer questions as we uh, conclude this presentation. Um, you let me know. Um, let's go and look at questions, uh, Kat, first. And if there are none, I'll. I'll... I didn't get any uh, questions in the chat box. so. And, and we're we're such a small group here. I think if anyone yes. has a question, feel free to turn your mic on, and and we can have uh, just a good discussion. So um, while we uh, wait for okay, so time in, I, I, yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I kind of wanted to circle back. Um, to the ribbon, the pH ribbon. Yes. And kind of touch on that a little bit and, mm -hmm. and see how, um, you know, those items that we talked about, the three items, the, you know, the carbon reduction, the renewable energy and, um, and taking care of the site, um, how that gets worked into the ribbon or does it not That's, all? that's a great point. And I don't say that because I mean, uh, I went to charm school. It's yeah. truly a great question. Um, it isn't. And okay. the, the yes, the renewable is integrated in more in terms of the um, carbon reduction mm -hmm. and um, renewable uh, energy um, equipment manufacturers are very clever. Um, we use a solar edge uh, inverter and whenever you check your solar edge, uh, solar production, the first thing it shows you is how many trees you've saved and yeah. um, in uh, tree equivalent uh, to the global warming potential. And so, but that would be very easy to do because that's the flexibility of the ribbon. Um, I don't know uh, how the ribbon uh, would integrate it in its final um, uh, tally, but um, you could introduce it exactly like you introduce other materials. You could basically have a, a line item for site. You could have mm. a line item. You could expand on your site um, during the uh, construction part um, and um, um, add more uh, elements and enter manually your own information. And in terms of uh, maintenance, you could go in the operational, the, the B7 and B6 uh, group, use the maintenance and um, enter some values there. So in a crude way, you could reflect that. It would be very interesting to see because there it's not so much an end of uh, life product uh, issue, it would actually probably minimize that in proportion to the operational CO2, but it would increase the slope of the um, operational uh, part of the CO2. And that's where you could look at strategies that would reduce the operational carbon from your site and mm -hmm. um, from um, um, the, 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 opera the maintenance of the site, as well as the choice of products. You can literally choose high sequestering um, uh, CO2 plants. Uh, there are some amazing plants that have been developed uh, for drought stricken countries and for countries with limited resources uh, to replace standard um, uh, farm crops. And um, one of them, for example, um, is uh, six foot deep roots. And it's a grain that could substitute for wheat. And, that product has been developed by a nonprofit organization and is uh, 
tested in um, uh, third world countries um, around the world allows people to lower the expense and um, uh, increase the chance of having a positive revenue from their farm exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so similar products are available and are well known. So just the different varieties of the same plants have um, different ways of handling droughts, handling um, nutrients and um, um, requiring uh, attention. So um, you could just uh, wisely select uh, in your in your in your plant selection in your landscaping, and a lot of those nurseries that are attuned to this are very supportive, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, pamphlet that Alicia gave had some. I'm trying to see where I put it. It's near here. It's right here. It's some um, nurseries um, such as. Um, there was um, meadow and fescue grass was from the Ernst Seed Company, ernstseed.com. It's mm -hmm. a, a company in, um, uh, I believe in Pennsylvania. And the sheep rescue is known as the Marco Polo sheep rescue uh, 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 seed. Um, and um, We've had good success with um, other uh, suppliers such as High Mowing uh, Seed Company. Um, and um, in Elliot Coleman's book, um, even if you never have garden and you'll never garden, Elliot Coleman's book is fascinating to read because he has such a deep understanding of nature and he's done things in um, on this farm in Maine at over latitude 50, growing um, vegetables year round commercially for uh, local production, just by understanding better how plants grow, live and what they need. And his um, discussion on um, the plant world and the references at the end of the book, you can get it as a uh, um, digital uh, book, so it doesn't cost you much, um, are worth the, the reading. Uh, there are other uh, references also, and if you're interested, I'll be very glad to um, put some together. One thing that's fascinating as an alternative to planting, and I'm sorry I'm digressing a little bit here, is what is known as companion planting. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you plant uh, basil along with tomatoes, or if you plant radishes along your cucumbers, the companion plant, the basil or the radishes, act as a foil for the bugs that would normally attack your vegetable crop. And so they spare the vegetable crop you're trying to grow. The basil by its strong odor masks the scent of young um, tomato flowers, which is what the bugs are looking for. And the radishes are more desirable to the bugs that attack cucumbers. So these kind of things have been known for hundreds of years. And the, right very efficiently replace uh, pesticides, for example. Right. Yeah, so, it's, I mean, I like your great presentations because uh, it's, um, it looks at the whole project as a mm -hmm. whole, right? It's, it's a holistic approach. But that's, that's what an ecosystem it. is. And we, we've been yeah. fooling ourselves by just looking at one small part of it. Yeah. And I don't expect people to become uh, gardeners and landscapers and start to hug trees. You don't have to do that. You just have to be informed and guide the project in the right direction. Definitely. And um, I had another question with, um, I know we're nearing the end of our time, but um, I had a question about the, um, I know we're all trying to st stop using spray foam, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's just such a difficult thing to, um, to kind of uh, move a, a away from. Mm -hmm. So um, I was curious how you felt about the low GWP spray foam and if you found success in it. I think- or You just steer clear of it. No, I cannot. And that okay. is the sad part of this whole story. Yeah. It's, it's especially critical when you look at uh, 
remodeling, a uh, high efficiency remodeling. Yeah. Problem is you do not have the option of deep cavities to go mm -hmm. foam free constructions um, that are possible with new construction. Um, sometimes the issue is the uh, historic value of the exterior of the building. Sometimes it's the lack of space inside the building. And in all cases, it's also an issue of the additional cost of making this, these big changes. And additionally, sometimes it's a structural issue. Mm -hmm. For all these reasons, unfortunately, we do not have the green uh, form. Um, you, I've seen some, ironically, I've seen some bio-based forms that are made from corn and um, from other uh, um, algaes and so on. And they literally, bio-based in the sense you can dissolve them in water. Um, yeah. But um, they're not commercially available for at the scale that buildings require them. They become available in packaging, so they're mm -hmm. going in the right direction. And one day somebody will discover um, amazing new materials. There was the vacuum uh, insulation, like Vacupore, um, that is R30 per inch. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's extremely difficult to handle. It, is, it was $15 per square foot which is uh, very expensive. You can't cut it, you can't shape it. Um, um, if you make the little, littlest nick to the product, you ruin it. And so it is extremely um, difficult. And I don't think it's ever gone very far. It's more useful in the uh, aerospace industry and um, other high-tech application than it is um, in uh, construction industry for that reason. Although there was one building that was done with that product in Minnesota, it was sponsored by uh, the Swiss um, uh, government because that's where the vacuum was developed and um, it was very successful, but uh, budget was didn't exist. Yeah. So perhaps it's just, um... It's just something we have to deal with for now until, yes. like you said, a new the progress has been enormous. We've yeah. gone from very high global warming potential to very low global warming right. potential. Now the issue is more the material itself, the fact that it's a petroleum byproducts. And right. so the alternative uh, for uh, biofoams is uh, something that needs more attention. Mm -hmm. And market pressures will eventually lead it in that direction. But uh, just like any new products, it takes early adopters to make it move forward. Right, right. Okay, Philippe, thank you so much for this presentation. I thought it was amazing. Um, thank you. If, again, if, if anyone has additional questions, please feel free to email us at info at ctpassivehouse.org. And um, have a great day, everyone. Take care. Yes, take care and thank you for listening to me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.